You'll have to forgive me for the self-indulgent nature of this video. Really, I'm making this for myself, but I hope it can prove useful to some of you in the audience too. I have somewhat of a mental hit list in my mind of big, relatively speaking, ticket pieces that I would like to slowly add to my collection over time. At the moment, there are three things on there that are really calling to me. There's no particular order to this, but the things I have my eye on are a Cartier de Santos, a Citizen Washi Dial, and as the name of the video would indicate, a spring drive. Now, the thing about these three is that I haven't made my mind up on an individual I would aim towards for any of them. Of the three, my outside impression looking in is that the spring drive is the most attainable, but I could be completely wrong. So the purpose of this video is to look at what a spring drive actually is and discuss why I think they're so cool and why I want one in the collection, but also to drill down into what models are available at the more affordable end of the market and to try and decide on what I actually want. So, as I said, pretty self-indulgent, but also potentially helpful to anyone who is also considering the purchase of a spring drive. With all that said, let's get into the video. I think a good way of explaining what a spring drive actually is starts with the history of its development. That all begins with a man by the name of Yoshikazu Akahane, who first joined Seiko in 1971. That's another important thing to mention for those not in the know, the spring drive is proprietary technology. So if you want one, you'll only find it within the Seiko stable of watch brands. Though in the modern day, they are most commonly found in Grand Seiko models. In 1977, Akahane was working on a twin quartz movement, but started to conceive his idea for a watch that combined the accuracy of quartz with the beauty, winding and architecture of a mechanical movement. A year later, in 1978, he filed the first patent for what would go on to become the spring drive. It involved his theory he dubbed quartz lock, but at this point was nothing more than theoretical. After years of development, the first spring drive prototype was produced in 1982. However, the movement would require an extremely low powered integrated circuit in order to be developed further or put into production. So in 1983, the project was put on hold for what was effectively an entire decade to wait for innovation in integrated circuits to catch up with his idea. I'll cut a long story short because there are excellent articles where you can read up on the history of the development process online, the best of which I'll leave a link to in the description. Essentially, the first spring drive launched for public purchase in 1999, and Akahane had to personally push throughout the 21-year development of the movement in order to make that happen. This is actually pretty depressing, because at the age of 52, Akahane had already passed away in 1998, meaning he never got to see his project to fruition and see his movements go on sale. His legacy is immense though. In my opinion, the spring drive is the most innovative upgrade to mechanical movements in modern history and produces a hand movement so smooth it outclasses a lot of much more expensive rivals with ease. While I'm desperate to start looking at watches, I do think it's worth taking a little extra time to try and explain how a spring drive works and show what the outcome of Akahane's life's work was. I'm not a huge expert in watch movements myself, so I'm going to try and simplify this as much as possible to make it accessible. In mechanical watches, you turn the crown to wind the mainspring of the watch. As the spring unwinds, that energy is used to power the watch. In automatics, the process is exactly the same. The difference is that there's a rotor which moves as you do, and that powers the watch rather than you winding it. A quartz, on the other hand, is powered by a battery. Quartz watches have quartz crystals in them, hence the name. When the current from the battery is passed into the crystal, it causes it to vibrate at a precise number of times per second. 32,768 tends to be the standard. Having this constant allows the watch to be extremely accurate as a result. Most quartz models will be more accurate over a month than their mechanical or automatic counterparts will be over a day. However, because the quartz model uses an electric motor to power the hands, you get a tick, rather than a smooth sweep of the second hand. I've said this in a previous video, but a lot of mechanical and automatic watches aren't actually particularly smooth, so while a compelling argument often used as a way of deriding quartz is that the sweep is better, 
really, a lot of cheat models have a fair bit of judder going on. As we've discussed, Akahane Spring Drive is a combination of both elements, but how does it actually work? Well, just like a mechanical or automatic watch, it's powered by your movement, either through a rotor or hand winding, and it does indeed have a mainspring. However, rather than using that spring to power a movement directly, it rotates a glide wheel which generates electricity which is stored in a coil. That charge is used to vibrate a quartz, to generate that all-important accuracy, but also to regulate the speed of the glide wheel with electromagnets. If you can't quite get your head around all this, don't worry, I'm right there with you. Perhaps the best way to describe it is by looking at the outcome. What you get is a watch that's powered by the movement of your body, that doesn't have any of the judder you might encounter in a cheaper mechanical or automatic watch, and so has an incredibly smooth sweep of the second hand, but is also just as accurate as a quartz model. Frankly, an incredible piece of innovation, but unfortunately one that only really appeals to horologists and took a long time to devise and implement. The end result of that is they aren't particularly cheap. Not expensive in the grand scheme of horology, but definitely above what your average watch shopper would be looking to spend. With that in mind, it's time to transition to the second focus of the video. If you like the idea of a spring drive, which model should you actually go for? Now, I will start with a bit of context. This channel focuses mainly on budget watches. I'm immediately going to exclude the seriously expensive new models, much as I'd love to own one, and I'm also going to open the search up to secondhand watches, but we'll start with buying straight from the source. At the time of writing, Seiko are selling 10 standard edition watches with spring drive movements that range between $5,300 and $7,000 in terms of their recommended retail price. All but two of these are dive watches, which have the rather unfortunate looking four o'clock crown that I'm not a fan of. The other two are very plain dress watches with the Presage branding. If I'm being really honest, these are extremely plain and don't really do too much to capture my imagination. I'm no expert in the hierarchy of how Seiko views its brands internally, but it does seem odd to me that there aren't any King or Prospects models with spring drives, as these would seem pretty strong candidates to have one to me. In 2017, Grand Seiko split to become its own luxury brand entity, so its models no longer appear on the main Seiko website. Again, for transparency, unless you're buying vintage, I don't really see much reason to be buying the standard Seikos over their grander cousins. The cheapest models in the Grand Seiko lineup boasting spring drives are only marginally more expensive. There is considerably more choice, and while I won't be looking at something at the top end, if you want to spend more money on a watch than you do a car, they cater for that too. At the cheapest end of the range at retail price is the SBGA 465G, the Kira Zuri as it's known. This model is immediately superior in my mind to its competitors in the range that also come in at the same $5,700 price point as it has a textured dial rather than a sunburst one. And if you know anything about me from the channel, it's that I love a textured dial above almost all else. Having said that, this isn't quite the famous snowflake that you might have heard of previously, and I think that could be quite an easy error to mistake it as such. That model actually comes in at $7,600 and has a few more premium features like the Unreal dial, blue steel second hand and matching print work. The Snowflake is the first spring drive watch that really caught my attention, but it isn't necessarily the one that I would buy if money were no object. I see the white birch as a bit of an upgrade over it, but in truth, Grand Seiko have so many amazing textured dials that I change my mind all the time. I think the Skyflake looks amazing, I like the Sea of Clouds, the models named after lakes, the models named after seasons. If I had to pick my all-time favourite, it would probably be the Cherry Blossom, but I shudder to think how much one of those would cost. In terms of my searching, what I learn from all of this mess of information is that I want a spring drive, I love a textured dial. Clearly the ideal situation would be to buy a watch that combines the two. Therein lies a lesson of experience that my horological journey has taught me. If I went back a few years, I would happily settle for either a spring drive or a textured dial as long as the price was low. Now though, I see that as a bit of folly. 
My friend's old mantra of buy once, cry once rings in my ears, and I realise I should only really buy what I actually want, or at the very least, what I think I want. That brings us neatly onto the second-hand market, because in truth, I won't be buying at RRP. I almost never do. The savings in the pre-owned market are too great, and the added variety of the back catalogue of older models is too appealing. It also opens up another sub-brand, Cradle, who have also used spring drive movements, though I think some of their designs are quite questionable. And finally, also models with both Seiko and Grand Seiko on the dial, which can be a little confusing. However, aside from the obvious concerns about wear and tear, damage, box and papers, and so on, when looking at pre-owned, you also need to be very careful with location. If you jump into an impulsive purchase without taking this into consideration, given the price point of what you're buying, you could land yourself with a hefty import tax bill. Of course, the market and availability for individual models is going to fluctuate all the time, so I can only speak on what I found in my research for this video. At the very lowest end of the market in my location is an SBGA 099, which is in great condition for around $2,800, effectively half the asking price of the very cheapest factory fresh Seiko spring drive. As we've discussed though, I don't really want a plain dial. I decided to ignore plain or sunburst models entirely and started to look for those elusive textured models. The most intriguing that I found was the Autumn SBGE 271 GMT model being offered at $4,250. Looking at this model in depth made me realize that in my searching, I'd actually abandoned a few things that are really important to me, diameter and thickness. Not only that, but I hadn't actually considered looking at the movement either. This Autumn model boasts an exhibition window so you can look at its automatic spring drive. However, it's 14 mil thick, which would put me off. Perhaps the most appealing model I saw from my search was the Shunbun, which is a little thinner, also has an exhibition case back and has a truly beautiful dial. But with an asking price of $6,200, I hit a bit of realization. I am either going to have to compromise here, giving up on dimensions, dial texture, exhibition case back, potentially more than one of these elements, or I am going to need to do some significant saving. That's where I want to open the floor to you for a few questions. Do you have a different methodology and approach for researching watches that I could use and maybe learn from? Are there other models that you think would fit the bill here in terms of what I'm looking for? Let me know in the comments section below. As ever, thank you for your time. If you've enjoyed what you've seen or found it informative, consider dropping the video a like and subscribing if you want to see more content like this. Thank you.